October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast, episode number 31, The Adventist Civil War, part 1. Last time, we dealt with the second major cause of the Adventist Civil War, the controversy over the law in Galatians. We looked at the 1886 General Conference and how sneaky General Conference President George Ida Butler tried to flex his muscles a little bit in order to win the day. From Europe, Ellen White tried to referee the whole affair by writing letter after letter to those involved, but that could only do so much, and Ellen White decided to come home. A storm was stirring the Atlantic, but Ellen White stayed on the deck of the SS City of Rome, studying those waves. The surging sea struck Ellen as both beautiful and terrifying, rising up as if in judgment before they were invisibly restrained. It was the deep, unsearchable power of the waves that impressed her, like countless other sailors since time immemorial. She knew all too well that the boat could be chewed up and swallowed in seconds if God so allowed it. She lamented that people, as she put it, quote, waste their lives in vain struggles after happiness, end quote. Happiness was fine, but it shouldn't be the goal of human existence. There was more to live for, and time was short. Where would human beings even be without God? Most of those on the ship were dancing or eating or playing games below deck, oblivious to the single, fragile thread tying them to life. And that fragile thread to life had been cut for many in the 1880s, most notably, of course, Ellen's husband James, along with J.N. Andrews, and the scissors weren't dull yet either. While D.M. Canwright was defecting from the church for the last time, John Byington was laid to rest in early 1887. Byington was the quietest leader of the denomination, You'll recall the old farmer served as the first General Conference president way back in 1863. And so another of the old guard had fallen. As Ellen White neared New York Harbor, she was entering a different kind of storm. Two young preachers, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, were locking horns with the General Conference president, George Ida Butler, and review editor Uriah Smith over two thorny issues the identity of the ten horns of Daniel 7, and the nature of the law in the book of Galatians. Over the past couple of episodes, we've looked at how these controversies escalated, much like Luther's 95 Theses, from a conversation to a bitter, intractable feud. But there were a ton of other smaller situations whose impact is difficult to measure. Butler, for instance, blamed Canwright's defection on Jones and Wagner. And then we have to wonder, did John Byington's death, not to mention James White's and Jan Andrews's, did those deaths remind Butler and Smith of their own mortality? Of the need for the old guard to close ranks and protect the church? Or did the moral failings of six young ministers, which we haven't talked about at all, did they lead Butler to think that the church's young ministers like Jones and Wagner were not of the same quality as the old minister? I mean, you know, kids these days and all of that. And what role did Butler being overworked and stressed out play in this? Or the looming threat of Sunday laws? You see, it's impossible to trace every thread that led to the Avena Civil War of 1888. But it's important to recognize that it's complicated. The Avenue Civil War was more than just a debate over a couple of theological issues. If you reduce the cause down to the law in Galatians issue, then Butler and Smith seem positively insane. I mean, you're going to blow up the church over this? No, it's like when your spouse lashes out at you for having the sheer audacity to walk past a piece of foil on the floor. I mean, you clearly don't love them or else you would have picked it up as soon as you saw it. I mean, what's going on here? Any experienced husband or wife knows that there's more going on here than 
stupid piece of foil on the floor. Something is bothering your spouse beneath the surface. Well, the main surface issues were these ten horns in the Law of Galatians, but there were plenty of things going on beneath the surface that impacted this controversy as well. It was a perfect storm, and Ellen White stepped into it when she returned to America on August 11, 1887. Ellen preached her way all the way to California. She hit every camp meeting she could, where a grateful church welcomed her at each stop. Ellen White, the prophet and now missionary, had returned. The church decided to hold the 1887 General Conference session in Oakland, close to Ellen White. It was one of only two times in Adventist history where the delegates met in Oakland. This was long before the Oakland Raiders football team played there, and I guess in that sense little has changed. Historians usually skip over the 1887 General Conference because the 1886 one more naturally led to 1888. And we don't want to lose sight of the plot line here, right? But the 1887 session is important, not least because it was here that Adventists really discussed and stiffened their resolve toward these Sunday laws. There was some debate about how best to handle them. I mean, should we boldly break the law in an act of civil disobedience? Or maybe we should just go along with them as good citizens and refrain from working on Sunday. Or maybe there's a third option. Maybe we could work on Sunday, but just do it secretly. Well, there was a resolution on the table declaring that Seventh-day Adventists would never put up with oppressive Sunday laws. And that bothered A.T. Jones. He wouldn't put up with that resolution. Uh, guys, aren't all Sunday laws oppressive by their very nature? I mean, what do you mean by this resolution that Adventists would never put up with oppressive Sunday laws? I mean, that's what they are, all of them. For Jones, it was a matter of principle. Adventists don't want any exemption from the law, even if they could get one. Because, as Jones argued, seeking an exemption tacitly acknowledges the government's right to pass such a law, and he wasn't willing to concede that. And it's not about the law enforcing Sunday rest either. Adventists should oppose a law commanding rest on Saturday too, out of principle. Jones asked, are we Protestants or what? Do we believe in liberty of conscience or what? Well, let's stir J.M. Rees to take the stand. Rees was one of the few working in the southern states at this time, which is kind of funny because it's really remarkable that Adventists spent far more effort and resources evangelizing Europe, I mean, long before they did the southern states of their own country. But there he was on the front lines in the south. Rees noted how he was preaching in Tennessee when some Christians came to spy on him to see if he would work on Sunday. Well, when he didn't, they chased him through the woods about a 100 yards, throwing rocks and firing at least a dozen shots at him with their pistols. And no doubt Rees' testimony shocked the delegates. I mean, it was, it was one thing to arrest Adventists and make them do hard labor or fine them or something for breaking these Sunday laws, but attempted murder? I mean, holy cow. Is this the beginning of a wider movement to kill Adventists for working on Sunday? Or is this just an isolated incident? As I said, you can see how this Sunday law stuff is really stressing Adventists out. Well, as 1887 gave way to 1888, a quieter and perhaps more fundamental controversy emerged. And here's where we get a glimpse of the deeper issues between both sides. The issue of salvation. Butler wrote in his little book on Galatians that he absolutely believed people are justified by faith. But then he gave it a weird spin. He said it was impossible for our past sins to be justified by our future obedience. In other words, God gives us the grace to obey today, but I still need atonement for yesterday's sins. Now, George Knight points out that this might be due to what he calls the misleading translation of Romans 3.25 in the King James Version, which essentially says that God has forgiven the sins that are past. Well, what about my current sins? Well, that's where you need to obey God's law. So if you asked Butler if he believed in righteousness by faith, he'd have said, absolutely. In fact, he even called it a truth second to none, one of the grandest and most glorious truths in the universe. 
And then, two sentences later, he wrote, quote, No man can be saved by his good works alone. Did you catch that last word? Works alone can't get us there, which, if you're paying attention, implies that they can get you at least part of the way there. Smith wrote along the same lines in the review, noting Jesus' words that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are more righteous than the Pharisees. Okay, so how do you become more righteous than the Pharisees? Here is what Smith said, quote, only by keeping and teaching others to keep the commandments, end quote. Now, Smith will go on to say, like Butler, that righteousness by faith is an essential part. That's his phrase, an essential part of the process. But you walk away a little confused. J.F. Ballinger would later write and clear it up for us. This is what he said, quote, When we obey, that act coupled with our faith secures our justification. End quote. Wagner watched all of this with horror. Certainly, he was an Adventist, and that meant people should keep the Sabbath and all of that. People needed to do their best to keep God's law. But he stopped short of saying that trying to keep God's law was going to save you. Not a chance. Whereas Smith saw the problem of the Pharisees as just not having enough obedience, or perhaps obeying tradition rather than God, Wagner saw the problem of the Pharisees as not having any faith. That was their problem. They trusted their own obedience rather than God, and it seemed to Wagner that the Pharisees were far from dead. This clash over the role of faith and works would be the pivotal battle of the coming war and determine the nature of the Adventist church ever since. Ellen White, a couple of years later, left no doubt about her views on this. Quote, As a people... We have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law. End quote. You're probably wondering how we got from an argument over which law was talked about in Galatians to this topic of righteousness by faith and how we're saved. Well, mostly it's because of that last verse in Galatians chapter 2. If righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. That's what it says. This verse threatened Butler and Smith. And that's why they had to say that the law in Galatians was not the moral law, not the Ten Commandments, but the ceremonial law of sacrifices and feasts and all that stuff. But Jones and Wagner read it like this. If you could be saved by keeping the moral law, then Christ died for nothing. And that's why Butler would say, you're undermining Adventism. If the moral law can't save us, then what's the point of keeping it? What's the point of keeping Sabbath? We might as well go back to being Methodists. And no offense to Methodists. Anyway, this was where the debate was going. And, you know, I imagine we're going to come back to this conversation fairly soon. Now, around the same time, Willie White wrote to Butler and suggested that there should be a meeting before the actual general conference meeting. What would this meeting before the meeting be about? Willie White proposed that pastors and church leaders get on the same page. Given the controversies of the hour, it'd do everyone some good to pray together, to read the Bible together, just to talk things out, sort them out. And it didn't always have to be controversial issues. There was a lot of other issues that need to be talked about too, like how to reach foreigners who have come to America, these sorts of things. There's been too much sniping at each other in books and articles from across the country, so let's spend some quality time together. Now Butler accepted the idea, and then it seems grew cold to it ever after. He insisted, though, that this meeting also include a discussion of the Ten Horns and the law in Galatians. So Butler advertised what he called a ministerial institute to precede the general conference session. Now, if you read between the lines, you can learn a lot about where Butler is at on this. For instance, he says that leading brethren in the church had this idea and have presented many forcible reasons in its favor. 
In other words, this is not Butler's idea, and the reasons presented to him were forcible. He couldn't resist them. And what were those reasons? Well, it'd be good to talk about church organization, church offices, how they should run, blah, 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 blah. Those were all these forcible reasons. There was a clear need for all of that. The church was expanding all over, and it was about time to deal with some growing pains. Fine. But then he writes this, and I'm going to read the short, delicate paragraph to you. Here's what he says. Quote, Bible classes would also be held in which various points might be considered, which are not well understood by all, and where, possibly, some difference of opinion may exist. End quote. Pause. That sentence is a master class in the politics of being vague. Notice the uncertainty, the use of passive words and expressions, right? Various points might be considered, and there may be some difference of opinion. I mean, huh? What? Various points of what? Difference of opinion about what? What is not understood well by all? And here's what it translates into. Guys, we don't all agree about some of this doctrine stuff, so let's talk about it. But Butler goes on. Quote, Such a move would undoubtedly tend to union, if taken in the right spirit. Such a period of consultation and instruction would certainly be most desirable, and if entered upon with suitable devotion and earnestness in seeking God, would add greatly to the benefit of the general conference itself. End quote. So coming together to talk would naturally lead to greater unity if taken in the right spirit. And then he says virtually the same thing again. This needs to be done with suitable devotion in seeking God. Butler is aware of how explosive this situation is. And I mean, maybe not literally explosive, as George Knight would have put it, but definitely explosive in a metaphorical sense. Sorry, George, I just can't let that one go yet. Butler wants everyone to check their guns at the door when they come to this ministerial institute. Come unarmed. He was, shall we say, less enthusiastic. But what could he do? Ellen White had publicly endorsed Willie's idea for a ministerial institute, and the General Conference president wasn't about to argue with her in public. So Butler had agreed to this at first, but it remained for him an unknown quantity. He wasn't in charge of it, first of all. It was suggested by people who increasingly, frustratingly, seemed to be on the opposite side of the controversy as he was. Sure, sounded good in theory, let's all talk it out. But how was this going to play out? Was it going to be a two-week Jones and Wagner rerun? Butler had other major issues that would define his actions at the 1888 General Conference three of them that we're going to cover. The first was that he resented his own weak response to Jones and Wagner. Now, this one might be a little surprising, but he blamed himself. Looking back on the past few years, he realized, man, he gave these two young upstarts way too much leash. He should have shut them down immediately. This is what he wrote to Ellen. Quote, I fancy a few days of Elder James White's administration when such a move as this would come up. If those men would not have heard thunder around their ears, if he had been on earth, that would have made them tingle, then I have forgotten the nature of his procedure. I have not forgotten the way he handled things of this kind. If he would not go for them in public and private and have them regret such coldness, then I misjudge." He would not have waited one week before he had put that thing through the review and showed it up in its true light. Now, Butler's memory of how James would have handled things is positively fascinating. We've seen before how Butler had always appreciated James as a kind of benevolent dictator that the church needed. But perhaps Butler projected a little more on the James than was there. You'll recall that Butler's essay on leadership in the 1870s was very dictator-friendly, and James was not a big fan. James could come down hard on people who stepped out of line, no doubt about that, but I think James also listened to people better than Butler did. James certainly listened to Ellen better than Butler did. In any case, 
Butler went into the 1888 General Conference lamenting that he had failed to live up to his hero, or at least what he thought his hero was like, and his failure only motivated him to be a better dictator this time. So he's coming into the General Conference session with a chip on his shoulder and something to prove. Now, the second major issue that Butler had on his plate was his undying conviction in the conservative tradition of the church. Now, conservative is a relative term. It's not bad or good, and I mean it in its most basic sense, the desire to protect or conserve what you have. So to Butler, the old is naturally superior to the new. Experience is better than creativity. We've seen how Butler is looking back to James White's days as kind of this golden age. Well, all of this is abundantly clear in the way he talks about Jones and Wagner. He constantly, and I mean constantly, refers to them as our young men or young fledglings or people with young minds. And you get the impression that by constantly calling them young, he's suggesting that they can't possibly be experienced enough to be worth listening to. They need to wait their turn, they need to put in their time, they need to rise through the ranks. Butler wrote Ellen how, quote, such a man as Elder Uriah Smith once held Wagner's view on Galatians and then gave it up. It was an error of Smith's youth, but he grew out of it with age and experience and wisdom, which by implication is clearly something Wagner lacks. Because if such a man as Elder Uriah Smith wasn't convinced by Wagner's venerable father, why do you think he would ever have his mind changed by the younger Wagner? Butler went on, quote, There are scores of our best ministers who have settled this question in their minds and will never give up the truth concerning it and can never be changed by what young men like these may produce. End quote. Oh, it wasn't all bad. Butler did admit that Jones and Wagner were good men with some talent. But that paled in comparison with these best ministers, by which he means older, experienced ministers, who, as Butler described them, were, quote, men of far more talent and experience, end quote. Uriah Smith would later echo the same kind of conservative sentiment, Quote, having by long study and years of observation in the work become settled on certain principles, I am not prepared to flop over at the suggestion of every novice. End quote. What's worse, Butler labels Jones and Wagner's ideas as innovations. Okay, so today innovation is seen as a good thing. But for conservatives throughout history, innovations were ugly. To this day, for instance, the Catholic Encyclopedia refers to Martin Luther's ideas as innovations, and it's not because they admire his creativity. As if channeling Butler, that encyclopedia reads, quote, Were not Luther's innovations diametrically opposed to the history and experience of spiritual and human order as it prevailed from apostolic times? End quote. Innovations opposed to history, opposed to experience, since the good old days of the apostles. Now, I'm not trying to suggest Jones and Wagner were the new Martin Luther or something like that, though this was a reformation of sorts. I'm only suggesting here that Butler and Smith's personalities were conservative, and that led them to reverence and protect tradition, to esteem those good old dogs who once ran in the early days. Butler and his pals were like the World War II generation, and almost by definition, every generation that follows cannot possibly measure up. Okay, so the third major thing bugging Butler as he went into the General Conference, his belief that the effect of Jones and Wagner's views were dangerous to the church. Before these two young guys, Butler explained to Ellen, we had a kind of gentleman's understanding. Of course, we disagreed on things in the church, but we didn't agitate those disagreements. We didn't provoke people by publishing our own views in the paper. Now, of course, everyone knows we're arguing, our enemies are laughing at us, we've lost unity in the church. 
And Jesus says you're going to know people by their fruits. And the fruits of Jones and Wagner were division, argument, bitterness. And it wasn't that these two young fledglings caused all of the damage themselves. No, the real problem was that Jones and Wagner inspired others. And Butler helpfully gave us some examples. Quote, Owen of Canada comes on with his new application of the seven trumpets. Elder Wilcox of New York, a man of so little judgment that he cannot believe that the earth is round, is able to give us special light on the fact that the seven heads of the papal beast have never been properly applied and that deadly wound of the papacy has never been healed with various other interesting particulars and Elder Haskell published them, end quote. I'm not sure you can lay all of that at Wagner's feet with any degree of justice, but that didn't stop Butler from trying. And you think the effect of Jones and Wagner's preaching was to divide the church and encourage all sorts of heresy? Then by golly, George Ida Butler was going to fight it to the last. So Butler had all of these things going on in his mind. He was determined to prove himself a strong leader like James he instinctively valued experience and tradition more than youth and new ideas, which made it hard to bring himself to even listen. And he firmly believed that Jones and Wagner's ideas were going to destroy the church. Oh yeah, this was going to go well. And things didn't get better for poor Butler either on the eve of the general conference session. He got a letter from a California pastor turned spy who informed the beleaguered president that Jones, Wagner, Willie White, and other prominent California leaders had secretly met in June to talk about the Ten Horns and the Law of Galatians. Of course, this pastor spy guy saw it all as a sinister plot to strategize how they were going to push their views through at the general conference session. And they had also pushed for this ministerial institute so they'd have a captive audience of the leading people of the, of the denomination. Oh, Butler didn't need much convincing. The report played on his worst fears, and his mood darkened. He sent notes to some of his allies, urging them to stand by the old landmarks and dig in. This would be a battle. The day before the meetings began at last in October of 1888, Ellen White wrote five words. We are in for it. 